welcome to church. Let's begin by praying together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that no matter how far apart we are from each other, you are always with us and that your spirit within us binds us together. We pray this morning for open hearts and open minds that you would help us to hear, to receive, and to put into practice the things that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hi all, my scripture reading is taken from Matthew 14, starting from verse 22 from the Amplified Version. Immediately, he directed the disciples to get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, while he sent the crowds away. After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was already a distance from land, tossed and battered by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Immediately he spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter replied to him, Lord, if it is really you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the effects of the wind, he was frightened and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus extended his hand and caught him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those in the boat worshipped him with awe-inspired reverence, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So we see that Peter was doing fine. So long as he looked at Jesus, then turned himself away from Jesus, because his faith was there. From the moment he turned himself away from Jesus, he started to sink. So it tells us today we need to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Have a good day. For the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at the lessons that we can learn from the lives of people who came before us, but who were also followers of Jesus and servants of Yahweh God. This week, we're going to take uh, some time to look at the life of someone whose name we don't actually know. She's only known in scripture as the Canaanite woman, which is terrible. So I'm going to give her a name. I'm going to make one up. I'm going to call her Phoenicia. She was from the area of Phoenicia. So we're going to call her Phoenicia. Now, Phoenicia was not a Jewish person. This story did not happen in Israel. Jesus had left Israel and come to visit her area, which was called Tyre and Sidon. And while he was there, <clears throat> Phoenicia somehow recognized that Jesus was um, special in some way. We don't really know how she came to hear about him. Maybe it was because she'd heard him speaking while he was there. Maybe she just saw how many people were following him around. And maybe there was just something indefinable about him. But she approached him in the street and started asking him to please heal her daughter, her daughter was ill and being tormented by a demon. She begged so loudly and so persistently that the apostles who were following Jesus sort of whispered to him, can you please get this woman to go away? She's being really annoying. Enough already. And Jesus, in that moment, interestingly enough, said back to his apostles, rather than responding to the woman, yeah, you know what, guys, you're right. She's not my problem. I'm here to serve Israel. She's not part of Israel. But the woman, she must have heard him say this. So she actually got in front of Jesus and down on her knees, blocking his path. And she asked him again, please 
heal my daughter. And Jesus, again, uh, speaking to her this time, tried to sort of brush her off, but she argued with him. She debated. She used his own words to, to make her point and to change his mind, or at least change his actions. Jesus' response to her was, Your faith is great. Let it be done for you as you want. He didn't applaud her insight into knowing who he was. He didn't applaud her persistence in getting her point across. He didn't applaud her uh, cleverness and her ability to debate with him. He applauded her faith. So what is faith? Now, my t-shirt <laughs> that I'm wearing today, not a coincidence, it carries a scripture verse that is not, not a definition of faith, but it's definitely a description of faith. This is the biblical perspective on what faith is and what it does. My t-shirt says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, that's one translation from the original language. Other English translations say things like, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Another one says, faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. And another one says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Faith is something that feeds our hope. Faith is the root system that keeps our hope standing straight and growing tall. Faith is the eyes through which we look around and see the world and through which we look forward to what is to come. Jesus said that Phoenicia had great faith. So what was it that she was hoping for? What was it that she had not yet seen. Well, based on the things that she said to Jesus in the, re in the record that we have in the book of Matthew, there are sort of three things that Phoenicia wanted from Jesus. One was she had faith in a world that should work the right way. She had faith that there should be a world in which children were not deathly ill, in which children were not tormented by demons, a world in which the powerful could lift up and strengthen the vulnerable, a world in which there is love and compassion and grace and enough to spare because those who have the most are the most generous. The second thing that she had faith in was her own influence. The fact that she should be able to make a difference. The fact that she should be able to use her intellect and her heart and her body to intervene. And that she would be understood. She would be heard. She would be seen. And she would be able to make a difference. The third thing that I think she had faith in was the power of, in her own culture, those who would have been her gods, those who are greater than mere humanity, those who have more strength and more power and more influence, the power of the gods to choose to act on our behalf. Three things that the world would function the way it's supposed to, that she herself would have an effective ability to make a difference and a supernatural beneficence towards humanity. Now, as I said, she would not have, we don't know how she recognized Jesus. We don't know how that came about in her mind, but so she saw in Jesus someone who would listen and someone who would help. She saw in him somehow the assurance, the reality, the proof of a world that would work 
the way it ought to, that her own ability to, to be heard and to be seen and to make a difference, and that there was one greater than us who could act on our behalf. And in acting on that faith, in stepping out and acting on that faith, Phoenicia found herself in some pretty good company. In the book of Hebrews in the Bible, in chapter 11, there's a long list of people who we look back to whose lives set a wonderful example for us, and sometimes not such a wonderful example. But these are all people who lived lives of faith. Some of these names you may recognize, people like Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Moses and David and Rahab and Samuel. They all lived lives of faith in Yahweh God. They all died in faith, never having actually seen all of God's promises kept. But, and I love this verse, paint this picture in your mind. They saw God's promises from a distance. They greeted them and they admitted that they themselves were temporary residents on the earth. They saw God's promises from a distance. They greeted them and admitted that they themselves were just temporary residents on the earth. They knew that they would not see in this lifetime everything that God has promised, but they saw it from a distance and they started walking. Like Phoenicia, she saw Jesus from a distance. Now, she had spent her life as a Canaanite citizen. She would have spent her life up close with her gods, her idols, her polytheon of supernatural beings with names like uh, Dagon and Mot and Yarik and Shapash and Molek and Astarte, each of whom were the gods of harvest or death or the moon or the sun or fire or sexuality. And you can bet that with her daughter being sick, she would have spent lots of time up close with Reshef and Eshmoon, who were the Canaanite gods of healing. But however close she got to them, however she called out to them, whatever offerings she gave them, they had no power. So not fully understanding who Jesus was any more than Jesus' own apostles understood at this point. She put her faith in him. She came to him. She kept on asking and she kept on pursuing. She brought her faith to Jesus, who alone had the power to say yes. And he let her see, not from a distance, but up close, to meet, to touch, to embrace. He let her see the world working the way it ought to work. He let her see and touch and be embraced by her own place in making that a reality. He let her see and touch and be embraced by the one who is greater than humanity, but who always acts on our behalf. We're going to read together some words that will be on the screen as our congregational reading for this week. We're going to continue as we have been, including some vocabulary from American Sign Language as um, an extra expression that we have been missing since we don't have the expressiveness of music to sing together. American Sign Language brings another dimension to our speaking words to each other and to God. And all of our words this week are going to be familiar ones. You may remember from previous weeks, continue. We're going to continue 
keep on. We are going to pray in the name of Jesus. So let's speak together these words that will be on the screen. Say them out loud with me and let your hands express what your singing voice would in a different situation. Heavenly Father, you have promised us the return of a world that works as it should. So we will keep on praying in the name of Jesus for your kingdom to come near. You have promised us that when we approach you, we will be seen and heard. So we will keep on praying in the name of Jesus for your kingdom to come near. You have promised us that you will always act on our behalf and that whatever happens, you are working for our good. So we will keep on praying in the name of Jesus for your kingdom to come near. We see your promises from a distance. We greet and welcome them, knowing that we are temporary residents of the world as it is, but eternal citizens of your kingdom. And we will keep on praying in the name of Jesus. And Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the example of people who went before us. So many whose names we know, some whose names we don't. And we thank you so much that we can learn from their willingness to come to you, to speak to you, to reach out to you, and to keep on keeping on, no matter how hard times became. We thank you that we can understand that just as they did not see all of your promises come to fruition, neither will we, and that your perspective is so much greater than ours. And we pray, God, for encouragement, for extra strength, for an extra sense of your presence with us, and for a little bit extra faith. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Contrary to what most people think who know me fairly well, I didn't grow up as much of a reader. Let me rephrase that. I didn't grow up as much of a book reader. I would read magazines, I would read newspapers. I remember as a kid, I would sit on Saturday mornings in front of the TV, watching Bugs Bunny and reading the sports pages of the newspaper at the same time. My mom would constantly tell me, stop multitasking. She didn't use that word back then, but stop trying to do two things at once, you're getting cranky. And I got cranky. I would read hockey statistics books. Um, I would read magazines about whatever. I would read the books that were assigned to me to read in high school English class or my Canadian history book, but, but that was really, really about it. It wasn't until I got to my late 20s and I began to see some of my friends' libraries that I started to kind of gather some books to read and people were giving me books. And, and then I went to Bible college in my early 30s, did a second degree, and that got me back into to reading. And, it wasn't until about 2006, about 15 years ago, I started um, keeping a, a diary of all the books that I've read, kept the list, and I've started dating. Whenever I finished reading a book, I dated it. And it's amazing how much of an encouragement and a challenge it is to do something when you start to actually keep track of your results and what you do. And so that's been a big help. Actually, I think last year, I finished uh, 58 books. Now, the pandemic <laughs> helped a lot in that regard, but uh, reading has more, you know, in later years become a part of, of who I am, what I do. And the challenge for us today is we live in a post-literate society, as some people call it. We, we read blogs, we read stuff online, we read, again, newspaper articles, short things, but we have a very short attention span. I find even sometimes I have a very short attention span and um, many of us don't have the discipline or even the desire to, to read books. Um, there's a book I read a number of years ago by a fellow named Pat Williams. He was the general manager of the Orlando Magic uh, basketball team, or was it the Miami Heat? It was one of those Florida basketball teams. And the book was called Read for Your Life. And he acknowledged in the introduction to the book that I'm, he says, I'm writing a book about reading. So those of you who are reading this are probably already convinced of what I'm gonna say, and those of you who don't like reading will never pick up this book and won't hear the message. <coughs> so he was like, I'm preaching to the choir. But he has a few interesting statistics and things that he says in this book. He says that surveys show that 59% of Americans, and it's probably the same in Canada, 59% of Americans do not own a book, not even a cookbook or a Bible. 59%. The average American reads less than two books in a year. The average male American, once he graduates from high school, will never read another book in his life. Um, the point of that paragraph in his book is that women tend to read more than men. And he said that only 5% of Americans have ever set foot in a bookstore in their entire life. Um, yeah, I, I don't think if it wasn't for the fact that my dad was my dad, I don't know if he would have ever set foot in a bookstore. Um, the challenge for us is that God has chosen to reveal himself to humanity through words, through a book, the Bible. And so the challenge is how do we engage the Bible? How do we make God's word a part of our everyday life in a society where reading and prolonged reading is becoming less and less a part of what we do. Last week the challenge for the new year was to begin to pray for one or two or three people that God would lay on your heart that you could begin to share the gospel with through your actions and through your words. And this week the challenge for our new year, for the new year for us, is to read the Bible to make reading the Bible a part of who we are. Now, most Christians will listen to sermons. They may read books about the Bible, read devotionals, remember Bible verses from Sunday school. But how many of us actively and consistently read the Bible on a regular basis? Theodore Roosevelt, who was president back in the early 20th century of the US, 
wrote that a thorough knowledge of the Bible is as good as any college education. One of my former Bible college profs, Dr. Gary Milley, posted a Facebook post a while back. And his, he said in a challenge to his readers, he said, the Christian who will read the Bible five days a week will find a growth in their Christian life that far exceeds someone who doesn't read the Bible at all. It's essential that we as God's followers read his word, not just for information, but that we read it also for transformation, not just so that, like Roosevelt said, it's like better than a college education. It's not just for up here, it's for in here. How are we gonna change how we live? It's not meant to be read like any book. It's the most interactive book ever written um, because we can actually talk to the author and ask him, what do you mean by that? We can be guided and illuminated by the Holy Spirit as we read so that the words on the page come alive. John 14, 26, John 14, 26 says, but the comfort of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said, will remind of everything I have said to you. This is Jesus speaking. The Holy Spirit's job is to help bring the words of Jesus to life in us. But in order for those words to come alive, they need to get into us. The, the words that the Spirit will remind us of need to be in us. We cannot be reminded of anything that's not already in our mind to begin with. We need to put the Scripture there so that the Holy Spirit can do His work. So why is Scripture important? What, what does it do for us? We're going to look at this probably a myriad of different things we could talk about, but we're going to look at five things. The first is that scripture guides us. Scripture guides us. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Scripture lights the path of our lives. It lets us know what God requires of us. It lets us know what God wants for our lives. It, it lets us know what it is that God created us for and how we are to live out our purpose that God has given us. It gives light to those areas where we might be indecisive and helps us to be able to make wiser decisions. So scripture guides us. Secondly, scripture purifies us. I remember years ago, the only time I ever went to a church camp was in my later teens. I went to Lakeshore Pentecostal Camp in Coburg, Ontario, about 15 minutes from where I'm sitting right now. And I remember one of the hallmarks of a Pentecostal youth camp are the altar services where people are called forward to seek God and to pray and to ask God's spirit to work in their lives in a special way. And I remember being at one of those altar services and praying and praying and then talking to one of the counselors afterwards, one of the pastors. And we got on the subject of the word of God and he just kept saying over to me that the word cleanses, the word cleanses. Psalm 119 verses 9 and 11 says, How can a young person keep their way pure? By living according to your word, O God. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So God's word informs us of what sin actually is. It affirms what the Holy Spirit does in our consciences and it puts it right there on the page, what sin is. How do we know if we're breaking the law without being given the guidelines, without the scripture telling us that, hey, this is how God created us to live. This is how God doesn't want us to live because he knows that if we go that way, it will hurt us. And so these are the things he's prescribed against. And that's what sin is. And scripture helps show us the way. We're living in the middle here on January 14th, as I record this, we're living in the middle of a brand new lockdown because of COVID here in the province of Ontario. And one of the things that a lot of people are complaining about is that the rules aren't clear. Probably because the, the rules in our neighboring province of Quebec are a lot stricter. Um, and they're using language in Ontario like state of emergency and stay home order, but yet there are all kinds of exceptions and, and to the rule. And so people are struggling to understand, well, what is the law about? I will be more than happy, they're saying, to obey the rules and the law. I just need to know exactly what it is you want me to do. 
God gives us the scriptures so that we can know exactly what it is he wants us to do, what it is he calls us to do, what it is we were created for, and what it is we need to avoid. Scripture informs us how we are to live. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We live out what we put in our minds. The stuff that goes in is the stuff that goes out. When I was in computer science way back in college days, um, we learned the expression G-I-G-O, giggle. I don't know if they still use it or not. Garbage in, garbage out. We live what we put in our minds. And the more that God's word penetrates and influences our thinking, then the more that will be shown in our behavior. And we will live out more and more the reality of the Christian life. So God's word purifies us. Third, God's word gets to the heart of things. God's word, in a lot of ways, doesn't mince words. gets to the heart of things. Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now, there's some self-help books out there that can be successful in getting us to change our behavior, but, but behavior changes that happen without a change of heart, without a change of mind, without a change of attitude, will only last so long. Real change comes from the inside out, and Scripture reaches to the inside. It speaks not only to our actions, but to our thoughts, our attitudes, the things that we value, the things out of which our actions come. And sometimes, you know, to be honest, we can avoid Scripture because of this aspect of, of Scripture. It can be unpleasant to be called out for our thoughts, called out for our attitudes, called out for the things that we're valuing that maybe are worldly and shallow and not what God is calling us to value. Um, a, this passage compares the scripture to a double-edged sword, and a sword can hurt. It's not pleasant. But think of, this, think of it differently, like surgery. A cut is made that is painful, but it is used to heal. Over the Christmas holidays, my dad uh, fainted on Christmas Day, has been having some issues with his heart and they have to call an ambulance on Christmas Day to take him to the hospital and they determined that he needed to have a pacemaker put in. And he waited and he waited and eventually had it put in on New Year's Eve. And it was interesting to read um, the instructions for his recovery. And they said, these are the things you need to look for if there's any problems. And none of them had to do with the heart. It all had to do with the incision. Make sure the incision doesn't get infected, you know, the cut. Um, you know, this was a cut that, that would have hurt if he wasn't under local anesthetic, and it caused some pain to him as he recovered. But without that incision, without that cut, the pacemaker would never have been put in. And now the pacemaker is regulating the, his heartbeat, and, and hopefully he, because, well, because of the pacemaker, he won't have these fainting episodes anymore and he can live with more confidence that his heart is being supported by the pacemaker all because a cut was made. A cut which would hurt, but which is bringing life to him. And scripture can be like that. Scripture can cut. Scripture can hurt. Scripture can be like surgery. But if we allow it to happen and allow the healing process to take place, then we're given a new lease on life and we're given more of the kind of life that God wants for us to have. Scripture cuts through our excuses. It cuts through our shallowness it, and challenges us to look at ourselves and to see who we are and to see who God created us to be. And it challenges us to reach out to God for help so that we can become like Christ, become the person that God created us to be. So scripture gets to the heart of the matter. Fourth, scripture corrects and teaches us. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Scripture is inspired by God. It is God's word given to us through the human personalities of the authors. 
And somehow in that process, we have received the word of God. And it says all scripture, all of it. And sometimes today, some people like to pick and choose. Yeah, I, I understand that, so that's, I'm going to live by that part of Scripture, but that doesn't make any sense, or that is too hard, or that just doesn't fit, so we're going to change that to fit the 21st century. And the challenge of Scripture is not to sit there and pick and choose the parts you believe in. Thomas Jefferson, second president, third president of the United States, uh, wrote what is called the Jefferson Bible. You can still find it today. And basically he sat down with the Bible and a pair of scissors and he cut out all the parts that he didn't believe. A lot of the miracles of Jesus are gone, a lot of things. And so you've got a Bible that has been kind of cut apart by Thomas Jefferson and you've got the Jefferson Bible because these are the things that he picked and chose which parts to believe. But we're not called to do that with scripture. There are difficult things in scripture to wrestle with, to, to try to understand and it's our job to wrestle with them and to try to understand them, not come from a position of, well, I'm the final arbiter of what I need to understand, so I'm gonna stay the same, but I'm gonna change the Bible. No, it's more about the Bible needs to stay the same. I need to work to try to understand the parts that are difficult. And the neat thing about it is that we have the opportunity, like I said before, to talk to the author to talk to God through the Holy Spirit, to help us understand what it is we're reading and help us apply it to our lives. Here in Port Hope, I think for the, a couple of summers over the last four years, there was a lot of excitement here in town because there was a movie shoot going on. Uh, Stephen King's book, It, was made into a movie and was filmed here, I think it was four summers ago. And then they came back two summers later, so I guess it was summer of 2018, and filmed the sequel and took over the town park and you know there were flag American flags instead of Canadian flags all over town and, and we, we became this small town in Maine and uh, there was one night where they were filming in a store and the rumor went throughout town that Stephen King was actually here that he was making a cameo appearance in the film and he was here in town so I remember I was walking I only found out, about, found out about this after, and I was walking past the, the storefront where they were filming inside, and there were a couple of hundred people gathered around trying to, to peer in the window to see, is Stephen King in there? What, what's he look like? And people trying to get his autograph or talk to him. But this film crew was very cautious. They, they kind of snuck him into town and snuck him out pretty quick and didn't really you know, make him available to the whole town or anything like that. Didn't get a chance to talk to him, didn't get a chance to, to have him sign any of your books. You couldn't talk to the author. But scripture's different. Scripture's, God doesn't kind of sneak in and sneak out. Um, the way that scripture is is that we can talk to God in prayer. We can, through the Holy Spirit, be able to understand more about what it is that God is saying. Scripture trains and teaches. Scripture trains us and Scripture teaches us. We as Christians are constantly, constantly in training. And we're trying to fulfill God's purposes for our lives and become more and more like Jesus Christ. And the thing is, it's not through our own effort. You know, if we tried to live the Christian life just by our own effort, we would fail because it's hard. It's not something that in our sinful nature we would naturally choose. But through the work of the Holy Spirit, through God, apply, the Holy Spirit applying God's word to our lives, um, we can begin to live out what God has called us to. And again, we need to get God's word into our life so that the Holy Spirit can make that application for us. We mustn't live with an arrogant sense that, well, I, I know stuff. I don't need to be taught anything. Years ago when I was working in Montreal, having a conversation with somebody in my office who was a Christian, and we were talking about the Bible, and we came across a, a verse that was maybe a little bit controversial to the topic we were talking about. I don't remember it. And somebody else walked into our office and uh, said, what are you talking about? And we made the point. And, they, and um, this person was a churchgoer, but I don't know, hard to say where their faith was. And so we pointed out the scripture verse to address the topic we were talking about. And the person got kind of agitated and said, oh, that's just a book. 
How can you, you don't live your life by a book. How, how can you live your life by a book? And then they stormed out of our office and the two of us were just kind of left there with our mouth open, kind of going, what did we do? What did we say? And some people have that attitude, but it's, it's just a book. How can you live your life by a book? The thing is, it's more than just a book. The Bible is the book of life. It's the blueprint for our lives, written by the one who created us and gives the guidance for our life. This Timothy passage says that scripture trains and teaches, but it also corrects and rebukes. The word rebuke in the Greek, this is the only time this word is used in the New Testament, and it, literally, it means to make an inner conviction of one's sinfulness. As God's word rebukes, it puts the finger on the things that we may be doing or the things we may be failing to do that are sinful and that miss the mark of how God has wanted us and called us to live. And it's important that this rebuke involves an inner conviction, not condemnation. I think people get those two mixed up a lot. They feel God's conviction to change, and instead they misinterpret it as, well, God's condemning me, and then they run from God. And they avoid the scriptures because they feel the conviction, but they understand it more as condemnation. But this inner conviction that God is talking about, that how scripture rebukes, is, is, is actually a call to repent, a call to change. Repentance means to do a 180. See, how's my hand work on the screen? It's going, you're going this way, and then you decide, oh, this is the wrong way, God's convicting me, I'm going to go the other way, and, and do a 180. That's what it's about. It's not about hopeless condemnation. The condemnation will, could happen after we repeatedly, repeatedly ignore the conviction. And then our conscience becomes seared, the Bible says, and, and scripture just becomes another book and stuff bounces off of us. And, and we just read it more for information rather than transformation. We don't hear the Holy Spirit speaking to us through the scripture. So our challenge is to accept the rebuke of scripture as an opportunity to change an opportunity to repent and to ask God for forgiveness and to ask him for the help to be able to change. And then this, this Timothy passage says that scripture also corrects. And again, this is the only time this word in the Greek is used in the New Testament. And it means restoring to a right state, setting things straight, creating improvement. So applying the Bible to our lives, uh, when we live our lives our own way, it, it informs us and, our cha and it challenges us that, hey, Maybe this isn't the way you're supposed to be living. Maybe this isn't the way God created you to live. And it challenges us to make a correction and to live life God's way. Scripture has its full impact when we're willing to be corrected and to read the Bible for transformation and allow it to change our lives. And quickly, number five, the Second Timothy passage, as you go on in verse 17, says the Bible equips us so that the man of God or the woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible lets us know how to live the way that God created us to live. And it restores us to that right state and gives us what we need to know in order to live out the good works that God created in advance for us to do. Now, there are probably some other reasons besides these five, but they're the main ones why Scripture is important. Let me review them. It guides us. It purifies us. It gets to the heart of the matter. It corrects and teaches us, and it equips us. So how do you go about making Scripture part of your life if it's not something that is a part of your everyday life? I think, first of all, you've got to recognize that, you know, for, for a lot of us, just reading is foreign. As we said, you know, the North American society has changed so much when it comes to reading. And so we need to step up to the challenge and make the determination that, you know, even though reading's not something I do, I'm going to, this is important. I'm going to decide that this is important, and I'm going to read scripture. And then work it into a level of reading that's, that works for you. There are many translations of the Bible, and some are, are, are like King James Version is written in Shakespearean language that could be tough to understand, and there are others that are written in more 21st century English. Find a translation that works for you and set an amount of time that will work for you. If you're not a reader, don't say, well, I'm gonna read the Bible an hour a day. 
You know, be realistic, but begin. Don't let um, don't set yourself up with too many high expectations where you kind of set yourself up to not to succeed. Find a comfortable place. I, in that book I mentioned before, the Read for Your Life book, that's one of the things that Pat Williams suggests. Find a place that's comfortable but not too comfortable. He said, he said, if I find a place that's too comfortable to read, I'll be asleep in five minutes. He described his chair where he sits and does his reading as comfortable but not overly so. So find a place that works for you. Maybe set your Bible out open all the time so that you don't have the excuse of, oh, no, where did I put my Bible? Oh, I'll read later. The goal is to try to reduce as many obstructions so that you can get to it easily. And set up a plan. You know, again, at the beginning of the new year, there are all kinds of Bible plans on, on the internet that you can find, or uh, sometimes in the back of a Bible, there's a reading plan for the entire year that will help you cover different parts of Scripture through the year. Um, start with a part of the Bible that interests you. The Bible is made up of 66 books in many different genres of literature. There are history books like Genesis and Exodus, and there are narratives that tell stories like the Gospels. There's poetry like Psalms and the Song of Solomon and Proverbs. Um, there's books that are more didactic. In other words, they're, they're, they teach things. And a lot of Paul's writings are like that, like Romans and Corinthians. There's, uh, again, there's other history, like in the Old Testament. There's prophetic books. There's many different types, and some of those books might interest you. Uh, sometimes when I'm talking to a young person and trying to introduce them to the Bible, if I get a sense that they're very artistic and you know, like to paint and do poetry, often I'll point them to the Psalms first. Or if they are really curious about Jesus, then I'll you know, point them to the Gospels first. And that's usually one of the first places to go is the Gospels. Um, so there's different types of literature in the Bible. So maybe start with a section that interests you. Don't just settle for a devotional book that just has like a scripture, one verse of scripture and then, you know, then someone else tells you what they think or tells you a story. I mean, those are good. Those are, I mean, I, I read one from time to time. They are good. But, but the challenge for this year is just, just shoot for just Bible reading and let the scripture speak for itself to you. My goal this year, and I've already fallen behind a little bit, is to read the Bible from cover to cover. I've never done that. I think I've read every part of the Bible at one point or another in different order, whatever, but I've never systematically read it from cover to cover, so I'm going to give that a try. I've tried it a few times, and I usually get bogged down around Leviticus and Deuteronomy, so I've got this thing called the one-year Bible, and it's kind of cool because every day you've got a section of the Old Testament to read, a section of the New Testament to read, uh, a psalm, and a proverb. And so if you do get to some of those drier passages of the Old Testament, at least, you know, you've got a New Testament section to read in that day as well, so it's not, doesn't get as discouraging. So that's my goal. I put it on YouTube. I am now accountable <laughs> to whoever sees this. That's my goal this year, that by December 31st, I will have uh, read all the Bible from cover to cover. And as I've started it, it takes you about 10 minutes a day maybe 12 minutes a day, depending on the day. Um, yeah, I think even if you're not the fastest reader in the world, I am not a super fast reader. I'm not a slow reader, but I'm not a super fast reader either. And it takes me about 10 to 12 minutes a day, which isn't, when you think about it, it's not a lot of time. So set up a system as well to note anything that strikes you as you read. Maybe get your highlighter out and highlight something. Put notes in the margin. My sister in her Bible, she's got notes in her margin and dates of where she read something that really meant something to her. Uh, have a notebook beside you maybe, write things down, get your phone next to you and, and type in um, something that whatever speaks to you so that you got a reminder of how the scripture has spoken to you. Remember something called OIA, not CIA, OIA, observe, interpret, and apply. Those are three questions to ask yourself as you're reading the Bible. Observe what's going on here. Just basically, what's, what's this story about? What's happening in this passage? Uh, if it's a psalm of poetry, 
you know, try to read between the lines a bit of the poetry, what's happening to the person that caused him to write this. Um, I interpret, what does it mean? What would the original author t say to you that this is what he, the point he's trying to get across? What would the original readers of the scriptures back in Bible times, what would they have understood it to mean? And then finally, what does it mean to me? How do I apply this to my life? Because if you haven't made the application part, if you stop at interpretation, then you're just re reading the Bible for information, not for transformation. The Bible is meant to change us. Now, people often confuse the two, like what does it mean and what does it mean to me? Scripture can have only one meaning, one interpretation, and that is whatever it is the author meant for it to, read, to mean. If you write a letter to somebody, what you're trying to say to them is whatever's in your head comes out in the words on the page. And if the person reads it and interprets it to mean something else, that doesn't mean the meaning of the letter has changed. You had put the meaning in the letter according to your words. So if you mean to say the sky is blue and somebody reads it and they say, oh, the sky is green. And you're like, no, that's not what I meant. <laughs> the sky is blue. If you say the sky is green, that's your, what you mean for it to you. You've applied it in a different way from what I meant it. And it's the same with scripture. I mean, the only single meaning of any scripture is whatever the author meant for it to say. And sometimes you'll hear people kind of, if you, you'll say something about the Bible and, and they'll go, oh, that's just your interpretation. The thing is, there is only one interpretation, and that is what the author meant for it to say, what God meant for the author to write. Now, you may, have a, you may misunderstand and have a wrong interpretation, but the point is there is only one. And our job is to work as best as we can to get as close to what the author is trying to say to us. And with most books, that's hard, because a lot of times we read a book and the author is dead. And even with the Bible, the original human authors are dead, but God's alive and the Holy Spirit's alive to help us understand what it is this scripture means. And then once we have that kind of figured out to the best of our ability, then we say, okay, what does it mean to me? And scripture could have dozens of applications. A scripture could have an application in your life when you're 12 that is totally different from when your life when you're 30 that is different from your life when you're 60. It hasn't changed the meaning of the scripture, but it has changed how it applies to your life. And scripture, again, being a living and active thing, is able to do that. Many applications, but only one interpretation. So last week's challenge was to let God lay in your heart one or two or three people that you could begin to pray for, that you have opportunities and on-ramps to share the gospel with them, both by your actions and by your words. This week's challenge for the new year is to commit to read God's word regularly, however that's going to look for you. Commit to allowing it to become more and more a part of your life and part of who you are. And allow God to apply it more and more. As you begin to understand it more, begin to apply it to your life and to change you. We're doing three weeks of challenges for the new year, and this week is challenge number two. And that is, quite simply, to read the Bible.